At the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we have one clear vision, to bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. Connecting a world of healthcare providers, generating discussion and encouraging relevant conversations. NNI believes that the more we promote and grow the understanding of nutrition today, the more we can shape the science of tomorrow. So, we foster and disseminate nutrition research to a global audience, sharing a premium range of resources, offering both scientific and practical information, which is available anytime, anywhere. And covering everything from the first thousand days to healthy aging, from cutting edge science through to sustainable nutrition. To actively establish deeper, more meaningful dialogue inspired by your needs, fueled by your desire to be at the forefront of scientific thinking and ultimately to help you in your professional life. Everything we do is built around you to help bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. NNI, advancing science for better nutrition. Hello, my name is Natalia Wagemans, head of the Nestle Nutrition Institute. I welcome you to the last day of the 95th Nestle Nutrition Institute workshop on building future health and well-being of thriving toddlers and young children. During the first two days, we have discussed the challenges in nutrition and toddlers and young children, including micronutrient deficiencies and the overnutrition, which may leave imprint on development and health for a life course, and also feeding behavior. Today, we move to the world of physical activity and brain. Session three is dedicated to health behaviors and the developing brain, and chaired by Professor Charles Hillman. Charles Hillman is a professor on the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health, University of Illinois. He holds different appointments in the Department of Physiology, the Division of Neuroscience, the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science Technology and Department of Physiology and Department of Physical Therapy and Movement. He is also an Associated Director in Center for Cognitive and Brain Health. Charles published more than 225 referred journals, articles, 13 book chapters, and co-edited a text entitled as a functional neuroimaging in exercise and sports science. Professor Hillman served the 2018 Health and Human Services Physical Activity Guidelines. He is very active in the research and continuously funded by the NIH grants. Charles, the floor is yours. Hello and welcome. My name is Charles Hillman. I'm a professor at Northeastern University, and I'm here to introduce the uh, third uh, session of the Building Future Health and Wellness of Thriving Toddlers and Young Children. This session is called Health Behaviors and the Developing Brain. Um, first, I'd like to uh, take a moment to thank Natalia uh, Wegman. Uh, and her colleagues at Nestle for providing the opportunity for us to speak to us today, uh, for us to speak to you today. Um, and second, I'd like to introduce the other speakers with whom I'll be sharing the virtual stage with uh, for this symposium. Um, so to begin, uh, I will give a talk uh, entitled Physical Activity, Brain and Cognition. Uh, secondly, uh, Dr. Naman Khan from the University of Illinois will provide uh, a presentation entitled Nutrition Effects on Brain and Cognition in Children. He'll be followed by Dr. Karen Adolph, who is from, the, from New York University, and she will deliver a talk uh, titled Importance of Motor Skills and Development. And then finally, uh, Dr. Darla Costelli from the University of Texas will present uh, her talk on the importance of providing opportunities for health behaviors during the school day. Uh, today's webinar presentations were recorded previously. However, all speakers will be available for the live question and answer session, which we will start immediately after the last presentation, and that will last about a half hour. We invite your comments and your questions, 
please uh, look for the question and answer widget or the Q&A widget on, on the page in front of you. If at any point you think of a question for the speakers, just type it in and I'll hold it uh, for the discussion portion at the end of the event. If we, if we have enough questions that we're not able to answer all of them during the Q&A session, the speakers will record their answers and you'll be able to listen to them uh, at some point after the event. In this case, a link will be shared with you and we invite you to uh, revisit the content for yourself and to share it with your colleagues. <clears throat> so the four of us uh, are excited to come together today, albeit virtually, uh, as a function of our common research focus on the influences of various health factors and lifestyle behaviors on the developing brain. Each one of us is focused on a set of distinct yet related health factors that affect brain development, including brain structure and brain function, and uh, as they're observed by uh, alterations in cognitive and behavioral outcomes. To this end, the four articles that were written from uh, the presentations that will be delivered today represent a cohesive and uh, collection and provide a window into lifestyle factors that may shape the health and wellness during childhood and across the lifespan. Thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to speaking with you again during the Q&A session. Thank you, Natalia, for that uh, introduction. Um, the title of my talk today is Physical Activity, Brain, and Cognition. So it, it shouldn't come as a surprise to, to most of you that, uh, the, that children are becoming increasingly inactive, that, meaning that they spend less time engaged in physical activity behaviors. As you can see uh, here, much of the world does not achieve the recommended 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. These data here are shown in 13 to 15 year old boys. So you can see that 13 to 15 year old girls demonstrate not only a similar pattern, but it appears to be even worse, suggesting that even more of them uh, do not engage in the recommended amount of physical activity behavior. Uh, unfortunately, what we also see along with the lack of physical activity is that the world is that the children of the world are becoming more obese with more than 124 million obese children worldwide. And the figures you can see here are for both boys and girls. <clears throat> now, not much research has occurred in preschool age children. With, uh, with a focus on physical activity effects on brain and cognition, what we know least about today is about preschool age children. Uh, that is to say that uh, early childhood is a critical period for motor, mental, and cognitive development. And when considering the importance of this period for rapid growth and development, uh, investigating the effects of physical activity on brain health and other health behaviors uh, on brain health is imperative. And what we see is that brain health in children less than two years of age is largely tied to behavioral milestones, such as reacting to faces, sitting up, and walking, many of which are, are just the precursors to physical activity behavior. The connection between physical activity and brain health in children under two is unknown. However, it's generally thought that novel experiences that promote motor skills, motor development, exploration, enhance neuroplasticity and cognitive growth. And this is something that Karen, uh, Dr. Karen Adolph will talk a good deal more about in her presentation. Um, in children that are three to five years old, active play is the most prevalent form of physical activity. And it naturally occurs in an unstructured environment. Challenges to the collection of physical activity and fitness measures uh, occur, um, and cognitive assessment in these age groups is also challenging to measure, meaning that we need to better develop our methods in order to better understand how to measure uh, outcomes such as physical activity and fitness, as well as their effects on cognitive outcomes uh, in these preschool age children. Now, if we spend the rest of this lecture today focusing on uh, school age children, so these are kids who are in their uh, pre-adolescent years, most of them, in most cases, we're talking about eight to nine or eight to 10 year old children, uh, we can begin to understand differences in the brain structure, the brain function, cognition, and academic performance that occur as a function of being physically active or more fit. And so if we begin with brain structure, <clears throat> this is uh, an example of uh, some data from a randomized control trial called uh, the Fit Kids 2 intervention. When, in which we looked at white matter tracks. White matter is the, uh, ax the axons or the, the, the sheaths that's, that encapsulate the axons uh, that, that we see that provide 
uh, that we see in the brain that provide uh, connections between the various neurons. And what we see is that certain, certain white matter tracts uh, are benefited by physical activity uh, participation. And so in this particular intervention, kids had nine months of physical activity intervention after school, or they, had a, a, uh, they were assigned to a weightless control group. Uh, group. And what we see is that from pre-test to post-test across nine months, we don't see much change in white matter in the corpus callosum, an, er uh, uh, an area of the brain that connects the two hemispheres. But kids who are in the physical activity intervention had an increase in white matter integrity, meaning that they strengthened these white matter tracts in this corpus callosum uh, but, um, from pre-test to post-test. And while we saw this in various other regions, it was not universal, meaning that we did not see global improvements in brain uh, integrity, white matter integrity, but rather we saw it in just certain uh, part or particular tracts. Now, in other cases, we look at areas of the brain and look at the structure of, the, of those areas, um, and we relate those to cognitive task performance. And so here we've, we've collected a sample of higher fit kids and a, section, and a sample of lower fit kids. And we're interested in hippocampal volume. And what you can see is that, that the hippocampus of higher fit children is larger than that of lower fit children. When we look at their performance on memory tasks, we use two different memory tasks. We use one item accuracy that is independent of the hippocampus, meaning that this, this memory task is uh, mediated by brain tissue that occurs outside of the hippocampus. And in this case, we don't see any difference between uh, higher and lower fit kids. But when we use a memory task that is mediated by the hippocampus, that means it's dependent upon a healthy hippocampus in order to perform this memory task, what we see is that higher fit kids have greater performance on this task compared to lower fit kids. What's interesting is that when we look at, uh, at the hippocampus as a mediating structure, we find that that hippocampal volume mediates that relationship between fitness and task performance only for the task that requires greater hippocampal uh, dependence. Now, secondly, uh, when, we, when we focus on the, the notion of brain function, that is how physical activity or fitness influences the functioning brain, um, it's important to first discuss uh, aspects of cognition that we're interested in studying. And predominantly, what we're interested in in this case is uh, executive control or otherwise known as cognitive control. And this is the intentional component of environmental interaction. What we're talking about here are processes that are deliberate and uh, require uh, uh, intentional um, interactions or intentional thought and action. And so we can, we can discuss executive control by, by focusing on three different areas of cognition. Inhibition, which is our, our ability to ignore distraction, stay focused. Uh, working memory, our ability to hold information in our mind and manipulate it and cognitive flexibility, which is oftentimes called multitasking, that is performing one task while you put a second task on hold, uh, and then performing a second task and putting the first task on hold and being able to, to switch fluidly between them. <clears throat> uh, all three of these behaviors are important for uh, school performance, and all three uh, take more time to develop than other uh, aspects of cognition, such as attention or processing speed. So, um, <clears throat> With that, I'd like to first discuss the FIT Kids randomized control trial. This is a study that, um, that occurred while I was at the University of Illinois. It, it occurred in collaboration with my colleagues, Darla Castelli and uh, Neyman Khan, who will be speaking after me. And this, this particular randomized control trial um, had kids uh, randomized either to the intervention, which occurred on 150 out of 170 school days. It was an after-school physical activity program. That, uh, that occurred over a two hour period and incorporated more than 70 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity in an intermittent fashion. Um, and that curriculum was developed by Daryl Costelli. Um, <clears throat> kids in the control group were randomized to a weightless control. And, there's, and what you can see here is that there's efficacy in this intervention because following the nine month period, kids in the intervention improved their, physical, their, their uh, aerobic fitness by almost 6%, where kids in the weightless control group improved by less than 1%, which probably reflects typical development. And so when we looked at uh, patterns of brain activation, 
uh, and we subtracted the baseline performance from the post-test performance nine months later, what we see is that using an EEG, we see that there's increased brain function in, uh, in areas of the scalp that, uh, that are germane to, uh, to executive control performance. And so what you're looking at here is the most difficult conditions of an inhibition task and a, uh, a, a, a cognitive flexibility task. And what we see is that there's increased brain activation in kids who receive the physical activity intervention compared to kids who are in the weightless control group. When we look at their performance, what we find is that on the inhibition task and the cognitive flexibility task, we see that from pre-test to post-test, kids in the intervention improve their performance by almost uh, twice the amount of those in the weightless control group. Now using functional MRI, <clears throat> we, we took a subset of these children and we measured their performance again at pre and post tests. And what you're looking at here is the, the bold signal or the, the function of uh, the prefrontal cortex. And we're looking at here the weightless control group where you can see there's no change in performance, sorry, there's no change in activation during that nine month period. We look at kids who received the intervention what we find is that at baseline, they weren't any different from those in the weightless control group, but nine months later, they showed decreased activation in this region of the brain. What's interesting is that we compared their performance at nine, um, sorry, we compared their, their, their function, their brain function, to that of a, of a group of uh, young adults, uh, college age adults. This is considered to be the most, uh, the period of life where there's the most optimal brain functioning. And what you can see is that kids in the physical activity group at post-test didn't differ from young adults and both were significantly different from kids in the weightless control group, suggesting that those who, had, who received the intervention nine months later demonstrated a more mature pattern of brain function. When we looked at their cognitive performance on the task, we see at, weight, at, at pre-test, the weightless and the, the intervention kids didn't differ. And at post-test, they still didn't differ. However, the kids in the intervention were no different from young adults, and uh, the young adults were different from the, from the control kids, meaning that they, they received some benefit by the intervention, but the benefits of the behavioral benefits clearly uh, may follow that of the brain benefits, suggesting they may take a little longer to develop. <clears throat> now, more recently, we've become interested not in just single pieces of the brain, but or single you know, areas of the brain, but we're interested in entire networks. And what we see here is that, um, is that participants who are more fit have greater activation within networks in regions such as the default mode network, which is involved in, in memory. Um, it's sort of what your brain is doing when it's not doing a task. Uh, in the two attentional networks, we see greater activation and more fit compared to less fit. Uh, participants, and the frontal parietal uh, attentional network, we also see greater activation. And importantly, this is, network is involved in executive control. It's oftentimes called the executive control network as well. And so what we see is that the, is that the major networks that are involved in higher order cognitive processes appear to be uh, benefited by greater amounts of fitness. And this is important because when we focus on children, we see that many of these same networks, such as the default mode, the, the attention network, uh, the attention networks, and uh, the frontal parietal executive control network all uh, are related to better academic achievement. And so in a sample of children, what we find is that greater activation within these networks is related to greater performance on scholastic achievement tests. And so it's possible that, that providing uh, more uh, physical activity in order to enhance aerobic fitness benefits neural networks that support academic achievement. So with that, I wanna change, uh, change topics and talk a little bit about single bouts of exercise. What we've talked about thus far is uh, accruing fitness over a period of months or years, or comparing fitness across groups. And here, I wanna talk about the effects of a single dose of exercise. In most cases, this dose of exercise is just 20 minutes of walking on a treadmill at a, at a very moderate pace. This would be uh, a pace that'll, that caused children to sweat a little bit, but didn't uh, prevent them from holding a conversation if needed. And so what you're looking at here is, uh, 
is performance at rest, as you can see here, on a task that's easier and a task that's harder. The harder task requires greater amounts of inhibition and, uh, and following 20 minutes of walking. And as you can see, following 20 minutes of walking in the more complex condition, the condition requires greater amounts of inhibition, we see greater activation of brain function uh, compared to after rest. And this brain function represents the allocation of attentional resources, meaning that following a dose of, of walking, these same children were able to upregulate or increase their allocation of attentional resources compared to when they were seated for 20 minutes. We've replicated these findings in children with ADHD, showing the, the same effect, greater allocation of attentional resources after exercise compared to after, after rest or reading. And we've even shown this effect in typical children who uh, differ based on their ability to perform executive tasks. And so in higher performing kids, that is kids who are better executive functioners compared to kids who are uh, poor executive functioners. In this case, what we see is that after a dose of exercise, the two groups don't differ, but at rest, they do. And, we would, and since they're better executive functioners, we'd expect them to be able to allocate attentional resources better than the poorer executive functioners. But following that dose of exercise, we see that an upregulation in the poor executive functioners, suggesting that that single dose of exercise provides a temporary benefit to those children who need, who need it most. Now, when we look at performance on, uh, on this inhibition task um, and looking at the ADHD data, we see that kids with ADHD perform better. They have higher response accuracy. They're more accurate on a task of inhibition after exercise compared to after rest. And we also see this effect in typical kids. They perform better after exercise compared to after rest. <clears throat> Importantly, when we give them an academic achievement test of reading, spelling, and arithmetic, what we find is that following a dose of exercise, a dose of walking, children uh, perform better in reading and arithmetic uh, achievement compared to following rest, suggesting that there's effects not only on brain and cognition, but also on applied academic achievement outcomes. Lastly, today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about uh, excess adiposity. Uh, and when we stick with this acute exercise bout, what we see is very different effects between normal weight kids and overweight and obese kids. And so as I showed you before, in normal weight kids, we see greater allocation of potential resources after exercise compared to after rest. But in overweight and obese kids, we see the opposite. That is that following the dose of exercise, their, um, their allocation of potential resources decreases meaning that in, in these uh, mostly obese children, we're finding that the dose of exercise actually may be detrimental rather than beneficial to their, uh, to their ability to allocate brain uh, resources towards a given task. When we look at their behavior on a, on a simple attention task, what we find is that is there's no differences in the simple task in normal weight kids between rest and exercise, but overweight and obese kids show a deficit in performance after exercise compared to rest. When we look at, uh, at reaction time, how fast they respond to these simple targets, we find a similar pattern such that there's no difference in normal weight kids, but overweight and obese kids, we see that they're slower following the dose of exercise compared to the dose of rest. And then finally, when we look at academic achievement, we see that there's a, a marginal increase or a trend for an increase in performance after exercise compared to rest in normal weight kids and a trend to have decreased performance after exercise compared to rest in overweight and obese kids. When we look at math uh, achievement, we find no differences across normal weight children with a deficit following exercise in overweight and obese children, suggesting that we need to learn a lot more about how to deliver this dose of exercise effectively in order, not just in normal weight kids, but also in those kids who are suffering from overweight and obesity, given that there's a large uh, and growing population in, in the world that is. Uh, that has, this, uh, has excess adiposity. Now, when we consider uh, other tasks that are not acute, meaning that we just look at, uh, we take obese children and we compare them to normal weight kids uh, without a, a dose of exercise on a simple cognitive task and a more complex cognitive task, what we find is that <clears throat> on the more simple task, there's no differences in performance between obese kids and uh, healthy weight kids. 
However, following the more complex tasks that requires greater amounts of response inhibition, what we see is that obese kids perform more poorly than, uh, than normal weight or healthy, kid, healthy weight kids. When we look at brain function and we subtract the simple task from the, go ta from the, uh, from the task that requires greater amounts of inhibition, what we find is that healthy weight kids are, uh, are allocating brain resources or brain function differentially between the two conditions. And that's why you see such a large pattern of activation where obese kids uh, are allocating the same amount of resources for the most part uh, across the, the whole scalp uh, across both conditions. I mean that they're allocating all of the resources all the time, even when uh, healthy weight kids uh, don't need to do so. Suggesting that there's underlying differences in brain function that drive these effects on, uh, on cognitive uh, behavior. And then lastly, when we consider uh, when we consider obesity by measuring uh, the amount of, of uh, fat tissue or fat mass in, the, in a region of interest in the, in the belly or the abdomen, what we see is uh, with increases in abdominal fat mass, we see poorer performance, meaning a greater cost or a greater deficit in performance on tasks of inhibition and tasks of working memory. And when we look at academic achievement tests, again, we see with increases in abdominal fat mass, we see decreases in performance on reading, spelling, and arithmetic. And so uh, with that, I'd like to conclude today. Um, <clears throat> so the last few years have brought new insights into physical activity and uh, fitness effects on brain structure and function in school-age children. Um, and fitness has been linked to changes in cognition that are disproportionately or selectively larger for tasks that mediate that are mediated by specific neural networks, be it uh, networks involving the prefrontal cortex or networks involving the hippocampus. Single bouts of physical activity provide temporary benefits to brain function and cognition. We know those benefits last for approximately one hour, dependent upon the dose of exercise that they receive. Um, adiposity uh, or obesity may serve as a marker for decreased cognitive performance. Uh, excess adiposity appears to dampen cognitive and academic gains that we see in normal weight children. And uh, finally, early school-based intervention to promote health behaviors is crucial for lifespan health and effective functioning of brain cognition and achievement. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues and my funding sources. Um, you know, this work isn't done uh, by me alone. It's done by a huge group of people from around the world. Uh, and uh, they deserve as much credit for uh, the, the science or this aspect of, of research as uh, I do. So thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Professor Neiman Khan. Uh, Neiman is an assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Community Health at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He also holds a, uh, an appointment in the Division of Nutritional Sciences at that same university. Naman earned his bachelor's degree in nutritional sciences from Louisiana State University in 2006, his master of science and his, and his doctorate degrees in nutritional sciences at the University of Illinois. Currently, he directs the Body Composition and Nutritional Neuroscience Laboratory at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and his research has taken a multidisciplinary approach to integrate knowledge in the areas of nutrition and cognitive neuroscience, to understand the influence of foods and nutrients on specific aspects of attention, memory, and academic achievement. The overarching objective of his research program is to generate foundational knowledge in nutrition, uh, sorry, nutritional neuroscience, by translating the impact of health behaviors to childhood cognitive function. Naman has published over 70 research manuscripts and has received funding support from multiple sources, including most recently the National Institutes of Health. Please welcome them on. Hello, everyone. First, I'd like to thank uh, Nestle Nutrition Institute for organizing a very interesting and important conference. I'm uh, excited to be part of a very excellent uh, group of speakers and to share some research in my laboratory that is focused on understanding how diet can impact specific select aspect of cognitive function. As a brief background, I wanted to highlight that childhood is an important period and a uh, period of dynamic physical as well as brain and cognitive development. Uh, brain structure and cognitive development is comprised of several key processes which occur often simultaneously in varying trajectories until the third decade of life. 
Uh, this protracted development uh, trajectory allows for health or lifestyle factors such as diet and physical activity to contribute to optimal development. Research from uh, preclinical or animal models demonstrates that nutrition plays an important role in brain and cognition through a variety of mechanisms. Uh, for example, although the brain uh, accounts only for about 2% of total body weight, uh, it, is, it actually contributes to about uh, utilization of 20% of energy, uh, so it contributes to 20% of energy expenditure. Uh, therefore, the brain is an organ that has a high metabolic rate and high need for nutrients. Uh, nutrients can also play important roles in uh, cognitive function by having a direct impact uh, in uh, terms of energy utilization, but also photophospholipid synthesis, um, neurotransmitter synthesis, uh, we also know that nutrition can impact physiological health, which may indirectly impact uh, or healthy physiology, which may indirectly impact cognitive health. Uh, our laboratory has specifically focused on just a handful of these nutrients, although many nutrients are involved in brain health. Specifically, we have looked at lutein, fiber, and water. Uh, in the interest of time today, I will focus on our work in the carotenoid uh, lutein. Carotenoids are uh, colorful plant pigments uh, that are found uh, in high quantities in uh, green leafy vegetables. Uh, they are antioxidants uh, that provide plants protection from photooxidative stress. Uh, in humans, our bodies show a preferential or selective accumulation of only a handful of carotenoids in human tissue. Uh, in that it could include uh, in, in fat, uh, tissue, or skin. Uh, they can also accumulate in the retina as well as the brain. Specifically, we are interested in the fact that three carotenoids uh, accumulate in the macula, and these include lutein, zeaxanthin, and mesozeaxanthin, uh, where we know these carotenoids play important roles in photoreceptor uh, protection from uh, photooxidation uh, from sunlight, and they also uh, serve as function as uh, blue light filters. Uh, we also know that some carotenoids accumulate in brain tissue, uh, particularly lutein, uh, appears to accumulate in brain tissue in uh, preferential amounts. And that is very interesting because lutein, among other carotenoids, uh, is actually one of those that isn't consumed in large quantities. It's uh, consumed in, in terms of proportion of carotenoids, lutein only contributes about 12% in our diet. However, when it comes to looking at content of the brain in terms of nutrient uh, carotenoid accumulation, uh, lutein accounts for 60% of carotenoid content in brain tissue. Uh, further, what is also interesting is the, where lutein accumulates in the brain. Uh, this selective accumulation of lutein occurs uh, in the brain uh, across many uh, cortices, and we also see this in, in the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, which is suggestive of, of lutein's potential role in executive functions as well as relational memory. Another important aspect of this is that uh, because humans cannot synthesize carotenoids, their uptake is therefore dependent on dietary intake via foods and supplements, making them an attractive target for dietary manipulation. Unfortunately, our consumption of lutein and uh, zeaxanthin is very poor. Uh, these are data from a nationally representative sample of children showing that children typically consume about 0.5 milligrams per day of lutein and zeaxanthin. However much, uh, when we actually look at this intake relative to what would be consistent with uh, half a cup of green leafy vegetables, for example, such as spinach, uh, you quickly realize that we're not really getting these amphibils in our diet in any meaningful amounts. Uh, therefore, low lutein intake is another hallmark of uh, nutritionally poor diets that characterize uh, current, current Western diet patterns. And our work is focused increasingly on how this uh, how lutein may impact cognitive function Another innovation in the area of lutein um, science has been the ability to assess lutein accumulation in the retina, which we know strongly correlates with contents in the brain, uh, being able to assess that non-invasively uh, using a technique that uh, uses a macular densitometer, uh, relies on an approach that uh, is a biophysical approach uh, that can quickly give us uh, an assessment of lutein uh, concentration or macular pigmentation, what we call macular pigment optical density in the retina. And uh, this is about a 20 minute assessment. And we, can, uh, we have done this technique in children and shown its reliability. And what we can do with this technique is get an idea of how well so, uh, the nutritional status of somebody, particularly a lutein status in the retina uh, in a non-invasive manner. Interestingly, this work has been conducted among adults for several years now and has shown that uh, several studies in adults uh, of high quality have shown that uh, 
you know, inc increased consumption of lutein through diet, uh, via foods, as well as through supplementation can reliably change or improve MPOD status, but also cognition. So these are just some papers that I'm highlighting uh, in this area. Uh, I do want to highlight this information as you sh because as you'll see shortly, we have very limited data on the efficacy of lutein consumption, MPOD, and cognitive benefits in children. However, there is compelling data in adults that makes the case for lutein uh, consumption for macropigmentation and cognitive benefits. In fact, there's a debate regarding whether they are at the point where we can consider dietary reference intakes for lutein. Uh, we are hoping that our work in children, uh, some of which I'll share with you today, provides important information on this topic. Uh, in children. One of the earliest studies we did in the area of uh, lutein and cognition uh, examined the relationship between academic achievement and uh, lutein status, specifically uh, looking at lutein status in the retina, uh, which we know correlates with brain lutein. So what you're looking at here, here are scatter plots illustrating uh, the relationship between academic achievement measures on the y-axis and uh, macular pigment optical density on the x-axis among pre-adolescents between eight to 10 years of age. Uh, and what you see here is that there's a positive association. So this is a cross-sectional study uh, across all the measures of academic achievement uh, and macular pigmentation, even after we've adjusted for some important covariates such as IQ, socioeconomic status, age, and even aerobic fitness uh, and sex in these participants. Uh, which is on a very, these are very, very interesting because they were the first indicator that uh, the benefits that we tend to associate with ben of lutein and dust may also be uh, observed uh, in children. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, we uh, examined uh, the relationship of macular pigmentation, optical density, uh, and uh, memory function, specifically hippocampal dependent relational memory among uh, pre adolescent children. Uh, in this task, uh, in this small video, you'll see. Uh, participants are provided with an array of five sport creatures uh, where there is a study for 10 seconds um, and after this period they are uh, allowed a brief delay after which they are the, the children are asked to reconstruct the spatial layout of these uh, these creatures on the screen um, at a self-paced uh, uh, stage and what during the reconstruction phase what participants do is that they can create they can essentially uh, engage in a variety of different reconstruction errors. And what we can do is measure the distance and the angular differences between where a particular uh, item is studied on the screen uh, relative to where the participant actually reconstructs the image uh, or the icon of, uh, of the creature. And then that can give us an idea of how much error they commit uh, in, in, in this process. Uh, if you can look at, and this is, these data here show you the variety of different errors that can be made uh, in terms of misplacement, uh, the swaps that individuals could make as far as the edge resizing and also the displacement. And what we notice is that uh, essentially we see an inverse relationship between macular pigment optical density status and uh, relational memory, regardless of which error type you're studying across the board in these participants. Uh, of course, also still adjusting for those important covariates I mentioned earlier. So the takeaway here is that we have also seen the relationships in academic achievement and MPOD, but we also here extend those to relational memory, which we know is dependent on the hippocampus. In addition to academic achievement and memory, uh, we also extended the benefits of regular lutein, or greater lutein status to children's attentional abilities and underlying neuroelectric function. These data illustrate a comparison between children of higher, uh, with higher MPOD versus children with lower MPOD during a modified erickson flanker task. This task uh, assesses selective attention and has two conditions, uh, one uh, with varying degrees of attentional demands, and the incongruent condition in particular places a greater uh, demand. Uh, what we noticed here is that uh, we, we observed that the participants with a higher MPOD exhibit greater accuracy, particularly in task condition that requires attentional, greater attentional uh, selective attention. In addition to behavior performance, we also measured uh, event-related potentials in these participants, specifically focused on the P3, which is a component that uh, can index attentional control and information processing speed. Um, and this is collected using an EEG cap that's placed on the participants while they're doing the flanker task. And what we learned from these, uh, from, from these EEG patterns was that children with greater MPOD not only exhibited greater accuracy during the task condition, necessitating greater attentional demands, they also exhibited lower P3 amplitude uh, relative to the participants who have lower MPOD, suggesting that greater MPOD not only supports greater accuracy, but also maybe related to greater neural efficiency. 
So these data were really interesting because they went beyond just tell, telling us about behavioral performance, but actually perhaps giving us some indication of uh, some benefits in the neural mechanisms that I employ when the participants engage in intentional uh, tasks and the relationship of potential benefit uh, of greater routine status. So thus far, the findings that I've shared with you were cross-sectional studies. Uh, and while they're very important to highlight some important relationships, uh, what we're really interested in is in determining, um, you know, in terms of policymaking or in terms of determining causal uh, inferences, uh, we want to look at the experimental approaches or uh, interventions to determine the extent to which consumption of lutein can impact cognitive function. So recently we completed a randomized control trial um, that uh, provided DHA and lutein to pre-adolescents between eight to nine years of age. Uh, in, uh, in these participants, we were, were, they, were, they were asked to consume lutein DHA as part of a fortified nutritional beverage over a nine month period on a daily basis. Um, and what we had was a, a lutein dose of one milligram and 32 milligrams of DHA uh, versus a non-caloric placebo. Uh, we had a lutein and DHA combination uh, because there was a, the previous data had shown that the combination of lutein and DHA in particular uh, is important uh, and is efficacious improving cognitive function. This has been work that had been done in older women in a previous trial. Uh, so as a first attempt, we utilized both DHA and lutein here. Um, and we examined a uh, variety of different cognitive measures, uh, not only uh, uh, looked at relational memory, attentional control. Uh, we have also collected measures on uh, brain structure and function. Um, and today I'll only share some of these data because we have some analyses that are still ongoing. Uh, but what was interesting and we look at our results uh, was that uh, we observed that uh, participants in the intervention group who were receiving lutein and DHA exhibited uh, greater benefits or improvements in uh, the, the macular pigment optical density uh, following the nine month intervention. And these are novel data. It has not been previously shown that, you, that lutein status improves in, in the macula of children based on uh, dietary consumption. So we're excited about these data. Uh, additionally, we observed uh, uh, benefits for relational memory, which was assessed uh, using a mnemonic separation task uh, that particularly focused on pattern separation. So what we observe is that the intervention group exhibits benefits in uh, relational memory. Um, we all, you know, of course, see a benefit over time in both groups, but we see that there's greater change uh, in the improvement in the intervention group. Uh, these benefits were also observed for the attentional uh, uh, control findings of the study. So this was based on a modified Erickson flanker task, where we, what you're seeing on the right here is the comparison between the two groups, pre and post, uh, based on their reaction time interference. And what we see is that the intervention group uh, that receives lutein and DHA exhibits uh, greater reduction in interference for reaction time, exhibiting greater performance uh, following the intervention. Uh, we did not observe significant benefits uh, for academic achievement, uh, so it appears that these benefits of lutein and uh, DHA in combination appeared selective for uh, attentional control and relational memory. But as I mentioned, these data are important because they're the first demonstration that we can improve uh, macular pigmentation following dietary consumption of lutein uh, and DHA, and that uh, we can also see some of these benefits for cognitive function. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to just highlight that we know from cross-sectional studies that uh, greater macular carotenoid status exhibits, children with greater carotenoid status uh, in the macula exhibit uh, superior cognitive function. This is consistent with what we see in adults. Uh, although there are a large number of trials, uh, randomized control trials that have been conducted among adults that provide uh, evidence of the benefits of uh, lutein for global abilities, uh, we have a very limited number of uh, experimental trials in children, and I believe we have conducted only one trial in uh, school-aged children. Uh, so the early indications are that we can see these benefits even through in childhood. Um, you know, what we were learning through these data is that lutein potentially has implications really across the lifespan. Uh, and of course, this is the very beginning um, of this area, and we have a lot of work to do. We need to determine, for example, what best approaches should be utilized, whether supplementation, food-based approaches are the best to use, um, and also measuring, you know, really the selectivity of these benefits uh, of lutein. And another important question is about addressing the intra-individual variability and the factors that impact uh, lutein status in individuals, particularly in children. 
Uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to acknowledge our collaborative team and research staff for their effort, efforts. Uh, the work I presented today involved multiple laboratories and collaborators, including Dr. Hillman, who presented today uh, as no, from Northeastern University, as well as Drs. Randy and Lisa Renzi Hammond at the University of Georgia. Uh, and also, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. Much of the work I presented today was sponsored by a project that included funding from the NIH, as well as the Center for Nutrition and Learning and Memory at the University of Illinois and Abbott Nutrition. So thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Next, I'd like to introduce Professor Karen Adolph. Karen is a professor of psychology, applied psychology, and neuroscience at New York University. She's the director of the Databrary Video Library and the Play Project. She's a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the Association for Psychological Science, and is past president of the International Congress on Infant Studies. Karen is, has uh, earned multiple awards, including the Cattell Sabbatical Award, the APF Franz Memorial Award, the APA Boyd McCandless Award, the ICIS Young Investigator Award, first and merit awards from NICHD, and five teaching awards from New York University. Karen has chaired the NIH study section on motor function and speech rehabilitation and serves on the McDonald Foundation Advisory Board and, and editorial boards of developmental psychobiology and motor learning and development. They, regardless of all of that, she appears to have found time to, uh, to publish over 170 manuscripts. Uh, her research on perceptual motor learning and development has, has been continually funded by the NIH since 1991 and she currently holds 10 grants. Please welcome Karen Edelf. My talk is about the importance of motor skills for development. As people think of motor development as the items on a standard milestone chart. And of course, motor skill development includes basic postural and locomotor milestones, but it's so much more. All behavior is motor behavior eating a snack, sitting in a chair, hugging a caregiver, walking, playing with toys, looking, smiling, eating and speaking. Those are all motor skills. Manual actions such as grasping and exploring objects or using artifacts or tools like crayons and spoons, motor skills, and social and communicative actions like petting a dog or pointing and nodding, pretending to drink from a cup. Those are motor skills. All behavior is motor behavior. So to the extent that behavior is important, motor skills are important and behavior develops. So motor development is really behavioral development. In fact, motor skills provide an important window into development. Generally, motor development is age related. So at first, babies can barely get their head out of the carpet, then they can race across the living room floor. Here, age runs across the runs along the x-axis, and you know, age norms are useful diagnostic tools because motor skills are directly observable and anomalies are correlated with developmental disability. But age norms are deceptive because age and motor experience are highly correlated. Older infants are also more experienced. For example, infants' age is correlated with their walking experience. But when age and experience are unconfounded, experience is a better predictor of skill than is age. So infants with more walking experience walk faster. Even at the very same age, walking experience predicts walking skill. That means motor skill acquisition is not a direct readout of neuromuscular maturation. And infants acquire immense amounts of, of practice. This graph shows the accumulated number of steps per hour plotted against days of walking. Each circle is a different infant's spontaneous walking in a lab playroom that's set up with toys and elevations and, you know, babies walk a lot. <laughs> the average toddler takes 2,400 steps per hour. That's like 14,000 steps a day. 
And we see the same thing in a new sample of infants tested in a lab playroom that's set up with different toys and different elevations in a different configuration. And we see the same thing when we record walking in babies' homes. Infants show immense variability in when skills develop and in which skills develop. Long red bars here show the normal range in skill onset ages. There's huge differences between babies in when skills appear. For example, some babies start walking at 10 months and some don't walk till 16 months. There's also widespread variability in the form of each skill. So take crawling on hands and knees. Some children crawl on their hands and knees, but some crawl on their hands and feet. And babies can crawl with their bellies dragging along the floor. They can inchworm crawl with their belly up and down. Children solve the problem of moving in lots of different ways. And some of the ways the babies solve the problem of moving, they're not exactly crawling, they're not exactly sitting, it's sort of a combination of both, or they're hitching, <laughs> um, bum shuffling. Anyway, there's lots of ways of getting around. Another problem with the standard milestone chart is that it perpetuates the idea of a universal series of milestones. But age norms are normed on some sample of people, and that sample depends on the culture and on the caregivers. Caregi caregiving practices affect motor skill acquisition. So you're looking at a film of an infant bath and in Molly, and the handling and the holding look rough to westernize. But in some cultures, caregivers don't hold their babies like they're a fragile carton of eggs. And it turns out that cross-cultural work and true experiments, true experiments with random assignment to exercise and to control groups show that exercise accelerates cells like sitting and walking. And there's a dose response effect. That means that the more exercise caregivers give their babies, the earlier are onset ages for skills like sitting and walking and for skills like head control and postural control. Here you see an Armenian man exercising his infant to promote motor development. In many cultures, vigorous exercise like this is integral to childbearing. It's part of parents' expectations about what you should do, what you need to do to ensure that your child has healthy motor development. Exercise facilitates motor development. Well, constraint delays motor development. All over Central Asia, caregivers bind their infants in a special cradle. They're bound from neck to toe, prevents all movement except in baby's fingers and toes. And although this practice is common in Central Asia, Central Asia is not represented in developmental science. The World Health Organization published standards, standards, not norms, of the ages when infants should sit, should crawl, should stand and walk. And these standards are based on data from six countries, but none of those countries were from Central Asia or from cultures that constrain movements, and none of them are from cultures that exercise or facilitate infants' movements. The red curve here are data from infants in Tajikistan. These are babies who were cradled through most of the first two years. And you see substantial delays, up to several months, delays relative to cultures like ours that don't constrain movements. But by 20 months of age, all the Tajik infants are displaying all the basic skills. And you don't have to travel to Central Asia to see the effects of restriction. In 1992, the American Academy of Pediatrics started the Back to Sleep campaign. So they told parents to put their babies to sleep on their backs to avoid sudden infant death syndrome. And that led caregivers to encourage less prone time when babies were awake. Restricted prone time had the inadvertent consequence of delays in prone skills, 
So then the American Academy of Pediatrics had to institute a tummy time campaign. Development of motor skills make behavior more flexible and more functional. Flexibility is necessary, it's not optional, because children have to cope with a variable body in a variable world. I'll give you an example. This is an adjustable drop-off apparatus. So it can have really small drop-offs that are like a step, so it affords locomotion, or really big drop-offs like a cliff where locomotion is impossible. And visual and haptic information are available to tell babies about the relations between their bodies and the environment. So they can get perceptual information from looking and from touching. Experienced crawling infants select their actions adaptively. So they will easily crawl down drop-offs within their ability, but they will not attempt to crawl down drop-offs that are beyond their ability. Even if it's one centimeter beyond their ability, they will not crawl down. But what happens in the same age infants who are new walkers? Novice walkers repeatedly attempt to walk down drop-offs that are beyond their abilities. They really do, even at 90 centimeters. Even on a cliff, they'll plunge right over the edge. They behave as if they have no clue about the limits of their own abilities. But six months later, after infants have several months of walking experience, again, they select their actions adaptively. Again, they can perceive precisely within one centimeter of accuracy whether a drop-off is safe for walking. Experienced 18-month-old walkers look like experienced 12-month-old crawlers. They know precisely whether a drop-off is too high for walking, and if it's too high, they find an alternative strategy. Here's the data. So zero here represents the largest drop-off that each infant could navigate. So the data are normalized to each infant's ability. The negative numbers are drop-offs that are smaller than the threshold, so they're safe. The positive numbers are drop-offs that are larger than the threshold, so these are risky. And then there's a really easy one centimeter drop-off and a 90 centimeter cliff-sized drop-off. This red curve is experienced 12-month-old crawlers. These babies are perfect. They're probability matching. They're matching the probability of attempting to the conditional probability of success. Here in blue, I added the novice walkers. These babies vastly overestimate their abilities. They'll attempt um, drops that are nine centimeters too large on 75% of trials. They attempt the 90 centimeter drop off on 50% of trials. This group is the same age as the experienced crawlers. The difference is they, they had not learned to perceive the relations between their drop-off and their new locomotor posture. Now I've added the 18-month-old experienced walkers in green. They perceive equally well as the experienced crawlers. So babies are coordinating perception and action through experience with that perception action system. Crawling experience teaches babies to perceive possibilities for crawling. Walking experience teaches infants to perceive possibilities for walking. And there's no evidence of transfer from earlier to later developing skills. Longitudinal data show really dramatically that there's no transfer from earlier to later developing perception action systems. This is a typical baby in the first week of crawling, totally clueless, no idea how steep of a slope um, they can crawl down. After 10 weeks of everyday crawling experience, just crawling around their homes, errors drop to 50%. That means half the time, babies can correctly reject the slope for being too steep and find an alternative way down. By 20 weeks, of everyday crawling experience. Babies have fast and efficient exploratory movements. They can tell within two degrees of slant whether a drop or whether a slope is safe for crawling or not. But then when those same babies stand up upright facing the same slopes, but now as novice walkers, 
no idea about how steep of a slope they can walk down. And learning has to start all over again. After 10 weeks of walking experience, errors drop again to 50%. There's no evidence that learning is even faster the second time around. Perhaps most important, motor skills lay the foundation for psychological development by instigating cascades of developments that facilitate learning across psychological domains. For example, when crawlers learn to walk, they go more, they see more, and they do more. Walkers go more compared with crawlers. Novice walkers spend way more time in motion than experienced crawlers. Novice walkers take twice as many steps. And novice walkers travel three times the distance compared to experienced crawlers. At each week of crawling, babies get faster and faster. But when the same babies stand up and start walking, they're faster from their very first week of walking compared to 21 weeks of crawling. Another consequence of learning to walk is that it alters infants' view of the world. Here's a crawling infant's view of the world. Crawlers see the floor right in front of their own hands. That's what's filling their field of view. Here's what walkers see. When babies are up, the whole room swoops into view. These schematics show the average field of view for crawling compared to walking. While babies are crawling, they see mostly the floor. While they're walking, they can see the whole room. And walkers do more compared to crawlers. These data show the amount of spontaneous carrying in same-aged crawlers and walkers. Walkers carry objects a lot more than crawlers do, even though crawlers also can carry objects. And Walkers also visit more distant objects, and they do more with the objects that they access. I want to end with one more example of how motor skills enable learning. These are two 10-year-old girls at a playground, and like they're using this fence to play. They're, it's not even intended as playground equipment. <laughs> Children use things like playground equipment in ways that were never imagined by their designers. Motor skills capitalize on all the opportunities in the environment. Children generate so much movement. About 10 years ago, I started to document how much children move. Natural activity is more abundant, more creative, more generative than researchers had ever imagined. And movement is social. Activity emerges from and builds on social interactions. One child's activity instigates another child's activity. As researchers, we typically study children one by one, all alone, or maybe they're with their caregiver. But part of the joy of moving is the joy of doing it with a friend. Thanks. Lastly, I'd like to introduce Professor Darla Costelli. Darla is a professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Education at the University of Texas at Austin. Her research focuses on the effects of physical activity on cognitive and brain health in children, which has been funded by the, the National Institutes of Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the American Dietetics Foundation, and the U.S. Department of Education. Darla is a member of two Institute of Medicine committees on fitness measures and health outcomes in youth and physical activity, physical education, and the cognitive benefits for children, which generated new national guidelines for physical activity participation in schools. She's a principal investigator on an NIH-funded grant, as well as co-principal investigator for Project A+, which is an evaluation of the 50 million strong initiative. Darla directs the kinetic the Kinetic Kids Lab, as well as the chair elect of Whole Communities Whole Health. She has authored more than 100 peer reviewed publications, two books, 10 book chapters, and has conducted more than 150 scholarly presentations and received multiple teaching awards. Please welcome Dr. Darla Costello. Hello, everyone. 
And thank you so much to the planning committee for your commitment to all of the modifications and adaptations that you have made. Thank you for the invitation to share uh, our work here in the United States at the University of Texas at Austin. I hope everyone is well and safe. My presentation today is about the importance of providing opportunities for health behaviors during the school day. In my presentation, uh, which is a brief overview of the background of our learnings and understandings of physical activity, uh, healthy eating, and early childhood, and how early childhood education has changed over time. I will also discuss um, some comprehensive models that we are using here in the United States and locally, and I'll make some recommendations for teachers, administrators, and parents, and how we can pursue this notion of healthy eating and being physically active as part of a necessary portion of child development. As we know, children are less active than previous generations, and this inactivity has really led to chronic disease that has been associated with um, sedentary behaviors. So much so that it's become the fourth leading cause of mortality, and it has cases and incidents of morbidity. Young children participating is far below the recommended hours of three, three hours of playtime. So young children who are less than five years old um, should be playing in three hours of structured and unstructured playtime, and yet that is not taking place. Only 33% of children who are ages 5 to 17 participate in the mandated 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity each day. Only one-third of our children actually meet those guidelines. And in Brazil, a study that focused on the same concepts of engagement in moderate to vigorous physical activity Children spent um, about 56% of their waking hours in sedentary time. And of course, this has happened because there is now streaming video, there is now cable television, and that only leaves about 2% of the time for vigorous physical activity. What do we know about healthy eating in children? Well, it's important that children consume the macronutrients because this is required for progressive brain development and healthy brain development. But yet what we realize is that fruits and vegetable consumption is far below those recommendations. Children consume more sugar and sweetened beverages than is recommended. And that is things like soda, um, energy drinks. At a very young age, they're consuming these sugar sweetened beverages. And we have concerns about inequities and health disparities in childhood obesity rates, um, particularly when making comparisons to um, whites versus Hispanic children. Healthy eating patterns really begin early in life, and we should focus on establishing those patterns among three and four-year-old children. Not only do we have these concerns in physical inactivity, um, a balanced, healthy eating diet. But we also have concerns about early childhood because there are changes within the structure of the school and we need to respond to those changes. Full day preschool is becoming the norm where children are spending almost six hours in a school day. This is time outside of the home and it gives us less of an opportunity for the home environment to influence eating patterns, and physical activity behavior. But it is, it does present an opportunity for schools and teachers to educate children about the importance of physical activity and healthy eating. I like to think of it as an opportunity opposed to a deficit. In schools here in the United States, there are several models that we are using to comprehensively address concerns related to physical activity and healthy eating. One model is called the whole school, whole community, whole child, where we think about the creation of health first policies and the importance of integrating physical activity opportunities across the school day, before and after school as well, and into our community. 
And we also consider how we can connect those physical activity opportunities to those of healthy eating. One example of a physical activity program is called the Comprehensive School Physical Activity Program, where physical education is the star of the show and there's formalized education about human movement, but there's also physical activity during the day, such as recess, classroom physical activity breaks. There is physical activity before and after school, whether that's a formalized program of youth sports, or it is physical activity such as riding your bike to school or walking to school. There's also teacher involvement and all of the staff embrace the notion of physical activity across the curriculum. And of course, all of this is supported by the family and community and their involvement in the lives of children and the opportunities that they provide within the community to be physically active, like parks and green space and recreational programs. Well, what do we need to make these things happen? Sometimes we are faced the reality that there are inequities um, within our curriculum and that some schools have more resources than others. Some teachers have been trained in slightly a different way and are, don't feel comfortable or are not prepared to offer physical activity or healthy eating choices within the school. We need to address these inequities by providing teacher training, equitable resources, and equipment for all individuals so that children can participate in physical activity because these things are a predictors of physical activity engagement by the children. We want to liberate children so that we remove all barriers and they can be engaged in structured and unstructured play. We also need to have healthcare and equity ambassadors if this is just change is going to happen within our schools. In the United States, we have the Alliance for Healthy Communities as a model of health and well-being, and we also try to create a culture of health within schools. Again, these are examples of comprehensive initiatives where all children um, are invited to participate in healthy decision making, whether it's for physical activity or healthy eating, and all adults support those opportunities for children. And so whether it's um, the members of the community, whether it's the policies that we create, um, a school administrator or principal, it takes a village to offer these opportunities for children. And these models suggest that we all need to work together to make that happen. So what are additional things that we need um, for these offerings? It's suggested that school policies consider health first. So many times uh, we are a well-intended policy to increase our knowledge in science, technology, engineering, and math are created. But what happens is that it's at the expense of recess or physical education. So we need policies that think about health first, and then we need to implement those policies as intended. Principals, administrators, um, those who are key decision makers within our schools need to be supportive of such policies and the development of those policies. They need to provide assurances that there are equitable distributions of resources and administrative support of teachers making decisions to take a physical activity break during academic time. Um, administrators can be very influential um, in cases like this and whether they're supportive or not supportive. Teachers need to model that physical activity and we can provide cues and signs within the school to say it's now time to play. No parking on the playground because it's time to play. And we can offer other incentives within the school day, such as if we work really hard during our academic time, then at the end of the week, we get some free time, that's physical activity, or the class gets to choose the physical activity. Specifically, what recommendations do we have based upon a summary of literature that we have conducted? This idea of adopting a whole of school approach where all adults and even the peers um, contribute to this notion of being physically active and taking a health first approach. Again, it must be comprehensive and a coordinated effort where 
um, messaging informs one another and there are positive messages and opportunities for children to actually engage in this decision making. For the very young children, play should be unstructured as well as structured. So imagination and parallel play and sand play and water play and cooperative play are all examples of how very young children um, at an early stage in the lifespan can experience physical activity in a positive manner. Encouraging physical activity anywhere, anytime, whether it's on green space or as pictured here on a blacktop um, during recess or physical education, even if it's in the classroom. Human movement can happen anywhere at any time. And I'd like to emphasize that in our paper, we put the self-determination theory, which focuses on building competence, relatedness, and autonomy within the individual students. In the physical activity realm, that means helping students acquire motor skills so that they can be successful in their endeavors. Um, here in this picture, you see some juggling and tossing and catching and some agility going on. And also this notion of building autonomy is structured on physical activity choices. Would you rather do A or would you rather do B? We also have recommendations for healthy eating. And the recommendations for healthy eating are very similar and parallel those um, for physical activity. Taking that whole of school approach, it is not just the nutritional staff who are responsible for healthy eating options, but it's also the teacher. How are you going to handle birthday parties and whether there's cupcakes in class and when you have snacks and what kinds of snacks that you have? So teaching children about a healthy plate and what is on a healthy plate, such as having nutrient-dense, well-balanced meals, that can all begin in the classroom. We need to think of eating patterns as a whole, as part of the child's life. Fueling the body is normal and necessary, but we need to balance that nutrition. We need to be sure not to overconsume or underconsume. So think about what's the ideal time to eat and what portion should be consumed at that time. We want our healthy plate to have be full of multiple colors of fruits and vegetables. And we want individuals to choose new things to start to consume. So for example, for a child who hasn't tried a, a kiwi or a star fruit or a mango, we want to provide opportunities for them to learn about new food substances, such as fruits and vegetables that they can consume. Whether it's policy approach or whether it's um, from an individual oversight position by parents, administrators, or um, teachers themselves, is we really want to limit the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. This came to the forefront um, about five or six years ago in the United States, and now many policies um, have been put in place limiting the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages within schools, but also the notion of offering products that are low sugar, um, low in fats, and low in calories in their consumption. So I believe the market is now being responsive to limiting the amount of sugar um, included in the potential beverages. And again, I wanna use the self-determination theory to talk about the competence, relatedness, and autonomy um, from a standpoint of decision-making. So we need to provide um, children the opportunity to choose um, fruits and vegetables. Is it gonna be an apple or a pear today or an orange on your plate? <laughs> How does this relate to um, healthy eating, how does it relate to fueling your body and how does it relate to good health in general? And then the notion of how do I make the right choice and when do I make the right choice is also related to the autonomy. In our paper, we provided an overview of specific evidence-based practices that teachers can engage in. We also, in our paper, provided an overview for administrators and parents. So on this first table, I'm gonna take a moment and highlight some things 
that we uh, provided as specific, very easy to do next steps for teachers. And in the next slide, I will talk about how administrators and parents can be responsive. And these are things that we can do immediately um, to begin to promote physical activity and healthy eating among children. Teachers can think of themselves as health promoters and they can model those decisions by choosing fresh fruits and yogurt and grains and definitely taking a student-centered approach. Teachers are continual learners and so engaging in professional development that keeps you on the cutting edge of how of innovative practice and how to teach um, very young children about the notion of a healthy plate. Teachers are champions and they champion um, a lot and they are asked to do that, but they can also be champions of healthy decision making. And in their practice, they can be habitually physically active. They can teach children about the long term importance of being physically active and cognitive development and brain health. And teachers are organizers. So in those models, key, teachers were key players in providing opportunities and orchestrating and facilitating those opportunities to make healthy decisions. In order for children to make healthy decisions, they need to practice those decisions. Teachers are organizers of that content and provide opportunities for children to do so. I have focused a lot on policy today and I think administrators have an obligation from a policy and financial standpoint. They allocate resources and they make decisions. If teachers and administrators can get together to collectively make these decisions, I think we can be more efficient in our use of resources and how we implement and um, adhere to the policies that are in place. And parents, of course, are key players. And one slide and one bullet point do not represent the role that parents play in their lives. But if parents can be involved in school and support the school curriculum and the healthy decision making in their home environment, what evidence has shown us is that children begin to demand those things at home. Mom, could you please buy some bananas this week? Or could we have some more fruits and vegetables? It would be great if we could go outside today. So collectively, administrators, teachers, and parents had a shared responsibility in fulfilling these roles. And I think by participating in this particular workshop, um, you're gaining an opportunity to be able to do so. And I wish you well in doing that. All of our work has come out of the Kinetic Kids Lab um, at the University of Texas at Austin. And feel free to contact us if you have questions about the models, um, if you find that you have a barrier in place that you would like to overcome. I thank you for your attention today, and I wish you well in your endeavor of promoting physical activity and healthy eating among young children. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello. Um, unlike uh, the presentations which uh, you just watched, uh, which were um, pre recorded due to COVID, um, we're here now live for the question and answer session. Um, obviously, we wish we were there live for the entire thing, but unfortunately, we're coming to you from our houses. Um, but I'd like to begin by introducing um, the, the panel, which is uh, Darla Castelli from uh, the University of Texas, who you just heard speak. Um, Karen Adolph from uh, uh, NYU, New York University. Uh, Neiman Khan from the University of Illinois. And uh, myself, Chuck Hillman from uh, Northeastern University in Boston. And so uh, with that, I'd like to begin with some questions uh, that you guys have asked of us. And uh, to begin, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna throw a question to Neiman Who's, who was asked uh, for, for preschool age children um, for cognitive development uh, to begin properly, what type of nutritious meals are required? Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I just wanna mention, uh, just say, uh, happy to be here and uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with the group. Uh, as far as the question uh, regarding the quality of meals uh, and uh, you know, cognitive development in, in preschool children, 
Uh, we don't actually know a lot uh, from randomized control trials. In general, the area of nutrition and cognitive function, particularly when you look at preschool and school age children is, is limited. Um, and that extends uh, beyond the limitations even further when you, when you try to think about mixed meals. So what we know is that, uh, what we know more of is about particular nutrients like DHA and lutein, uh, choline, but what we don't really know is about the, the effect of mixed meals. Uh, what we do know from some of the work that's been done in uh, carbohydrate uh, studies is that uh, you know providing children with uh, and even breakfast studies is that providing children with breakfast or a source of uh, uh, you know easily absorbable carbohydrates uh, may be uh, impactful, uh, particularly for children who tend to skip uh, breakfast, and that may be impactful in terms of their short-term or acute cognitive function, but uh, you know, the long-term implications are not quite well understood. Thank you, uh, Naman. Um, next, uh, it looks like um, we have a question for Karen, who uh, was asked, you mentioned back sleeping can decrease uh, SIDS. Uh, do you have any RCT data if so, please share with us. There's no, to my knowledge, there's no randomized control trials for, you know, that position babies in, um, in different ways and then see if they die. <laughs> um, so um, there are prospective studies, um, which means that they track babies going forward and there's retrospective studies where they ask parents at later points the positions that their infants slept in. Um, and um, some parents, so now, you know, it's pretty universal that pediatricians are recommending that babies be put to sleep on their backs. Um, um, but some parents still put infants to sleep on their on their bellies. Um, and so it's possible to see whether there's a difference in um, the incidence of sudden infant death syndrome, but um, more likely is that um, it's possible to see whether the, there's a relation between time on the belly and time on the back and when infants, um, the ages at which infants acquire different um, motor skills, so skills um, prone are delayed for babies that don't spend awake time on their bellies. And, um, and in some cases, they found that even upright skills are delayed for babies who um, don't spend awake time on their bellies. So the relation between back sleeping or belly sleeping and motor skills is because if you put a baby, you know, down, um, in whatever position, there's a little while before the baby falls asleep. And if the baby can't roll into, you know, can't choose for themselves whether to be prone or supine, um, um, when they wake up, there's a little bit of time when they're on their bellies or on their backs. Um, and so there are good prospective data now to show that putting babies um, on their bellies when they're awake it's related to earlier onset ages, younger onset ages for prone skills, like pushing up, um, propping up in a prone position, um, prone and reaching, rolling, um, and crawling. Thank you, Karen. Um, Darla, this question just came in. So since you spoke last, I'll assume it's for you. That is, what type of physical activity is recommended for obese children? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks, Chuck, for the question, um, and thank you to the organizing committee for um, everything that has gone on behind the scenes and, and pulling off this conference. Uh, I appreciate your efforts. So when we're talking about um, engagement and physical activity for, you know, children who have a body mass indices that suggest that they are obese um, and in an un in how unhealthy state, um, we have to be careful about those weight-bearing activities, and so the notion of, you know, high impact impact aerobics um, can really start to wear and tear on the joints. Um, I think the best thing for children who um, fall into this category is the notion of establishing a 
a positive rapport with the child, talking to them about their interests, how they want to begin their engagement with physical activity. The most important thing is to move from sedentary lifestyle into engagement and light physical activity, and then to tolerance on moderate to vigorous physical activity. And a lot of times the motives are about supports and friendships and interests and all of these other things uh, that are social determinants and supports of their engagement. So I would recommend whatever the child is of interest, uh, has an interest in, um, is to try to get them to engage in that. And sometimes it starts as simple as you know, walking your dog to the mailbox, walk as a family, um, providing uh, family engagement and parent modeling of that physical activity. So things um, that are have minimal impact um, and are not of a very high intensity uh, are physical activities that I would recommend. If the child's interested in dance, um, I think that's a hidden way uh, to try to have that motive, uh, whatever type of music genre that they enjoy, uh, get them to engage in that dance if at all possible. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Darla. Um, let's see, the next question is for me, how much physical activity is, uh, how much physical activity in relation to intensity, duration, and frequency is needed? That's a great question. Um, and, and that's something that uh, during my time on the uh, physical activity guidelines for Americans scientific advisory committee, um, we spoke a lot about, and, and the guidelines have pretty much remained unchanged for the last uh, really 12 years now, uh, which recommends uh, that children receive 60 minutes or more of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day of the week. Um, but that's only part of the story. That, that's, if that's your take home message, uh, that's fine. But, but really it goes beyond that um, in that kids should also engage in part of that time uh, during the week in bone and muscle loading exercises. Um, and a committee that, that Darla and I served at the Institute of Medicine suggested that, that actually schools should be responsible for half that time. I mean that in each school day, children should receive at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, in school. And that the other 30 minutes uh, could be acquired outside of school, either uh, on the way to school or home, if they actively commute or through uh, some form of physical activity such as play or, or engagement in sports or, or whatnot. Um, but, but I guess, uh, you know, one of the problems we have is that most kids, at least in the United States, and we know this in most Western cultures, don't even come close. And so it really falls on, uh, you know, both parents and school teachers and, and school districts to uh, ensure that kids engage in more, in the recommended amount of physical activity. Uh, which is a minimum, again, of 60 minutes or more of moderate figures physical activity. And, and lastly, let me say that, that that doesn't have to come in one big shot. Um, it can be uh, provided intermittently throughout the school day. So uh, let's see. Naman, let's go back to you. Um, I'm trying to manage both of these uh, documents here. Uh, and I have a question for you related to DHA and its relationship to brain health. Um, and so maybe you could uh, elaborate on that uh, relationship, please. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you know DHA, of course, is an essential nutrient that's uh, vital for both physical and uh, cognitive development. Uh, what the literature says, at least mostly that's done in DHA, uh, it's focused more on visual development. And uh, we know early on in life that DHA, uh, either even provided as a perinatal uh, supplement or early in life, um, you know, tends to promote visual development uh, in infants. Uh, we have limited literature on cognitive development. Much of it has focused on IQ as the primary outcome. And there is some suggestion that the, uh, DHA in early life and uh, even breastfeeding, for example, uh, could be linked to um, a higher IQ, but really, not a large effect size. In most, in often cases, those effects are mediated by uh, confounding factors like socioeconomic status. Uh, and beyond uh, infancy, uh, the literature on school-age children is actually pretty mixed. It it goes back to you know the the old saying about you know nutrition. Uh, you know, you have to think about the population you're actually supplementing with that really drives these effects. So the literature in older children suggests that uh, not not all children tend to benefit from DHA supplementation. 
uh, that tends to be, uh, those effects tend to be larger in children who are typically consuming, under consuming DHA or tend to have uh, inadequate diets in terms of essential nutrients. So children that tend to have some nutritional deficiencies tend to benefit to a greater extent, uh, you know, following provision of DHA, but we don't see that uh, across the board for all children. Thanks, Naman. Um, Karen, back to you. There's a question here on, uh, do motor, are motor skills influenced by uh, social exposures? Uh, if so, can you, uh, the, the question really relates to, are they more influenced by so, social exposures? Exposure. So I'm assuming that means relative to maybe genetic influences. Can you mm. pair them against each other? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. So there's um, there's very good evidence that motor skills, you know, broadly. Um, actually, I love this question. There's lots of evidence that motor skills, writ broadly, are influenced by social factors, and there's some evidence that social factors are more important than genetic factors. So, um, for the first part of this, um, this is like any kind of motor skill. Um, and so social interactions can influence which skills children acquire and the ages at which they acquire them and how you know, well they can perform the skills. So it's absolutely true for things that you would think of as being culturally specific, like whether a child can use chopsticks or you know, play ball sports or um, skip. <laughs> um, but it's also true for basic skills, like the positions in which children sit or squat or the ages at which they walk or whether or not they crawl. Um, and then um, um, in terms of whether social skills are more important than genetic factors, um, there's one really nice study by Brian Hopkins um, that showed that, well, that compared um, three groups of families who were living in Britain. So one group were um, white families that were sort of, you know, already living in Britain. And then the two other groups were Jamaican families who had immigrated to Britain. All three groups had the same prenatal care, the same access to, you know, um, medical care, same, you know, SES and um, similar living conditions and so on. From the two Jamaican groups, um, both of them came from a culture where um, parents deliberately exercise sitting and upright skills, um, where they expect that babies will sit and walk um, based on their social interactions, their you know, like physical manipulations of the baby. So they think about sitting and walking the same way you might think about reading or potty training that children won't learn that unless you actually you know deliberately teach them to you know sit on a potty or to um you know read you know read words on a page um so one of these jamaican groups assimilated and no longer performed um, exercise and massage and the other group continued to perform the skills in their culture and the group that continued to perform the skills of their culture achieved sitting and walking at an earlier age than the group with, you know, presumably the same um, genetic background, at least the same racial background. Um, so um, it showed that exercise is, you know, that, 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 that these culturally specific exercises accelerated the onset of sitting and walking. Um, and, you know, just as a, a I know, additional point, um, uh, the Jamaican culture at that point, at that time, um, didn't value crawling as a skill for babies to do. And so children were actively discouraged from crawling. And um, presumably as a consequence, children began crawling at about the same age or even later than when they began walking. So um, there's evidence that crawling is absolutely not an obligatory skill. It's just a solution that, you know, 
most infants in most places discover, just as they can discover bump shuffling and scooting and lots of other ways to move. Um, it's a temporary solution before they can walk. So yeah, social interactions are absolutely um, part and you know integral to motor skill acquisition, both really basic skills and you know high level skills, sports skills, dance skills, um, using artifacts, and so on. Love that question. Thanks, Karen. So it sounds like you you place nurture as high up there as nature, maybe more so. Okay. Um, so Darla, how can health behaviors be established in a in a school? Well, I, I love the way that you mentioned this notion of schools being responsible for 50% of that 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity each day. Um, I think schools are a microcosm of society and it takes a village to raise a child. So um, our broader panel network and the work that we do, it would draw on all of those entities. So for example, in school, we need to have healthy choices for eating. We need to have healthy options um, to move our bodies. And so within the school, it takes this comprehensive effort where we're establishing health first policies. Um, we are avoiding obesogenic or sedentary environments where it's okay for teachers to have physical activity embedded in their lesson within the classroom. We have opportunities for imaginative learning, um, theatrics, uh, we have opportunities for structured play, and then we have the notion of after school, we have programs that um, motorically refine our movement and provide that competition for those uh, children who would like to engage in that. That's a comprehensive effort in it would be great if our school day, as Chuck had suggested, um, ultimately begins with this act of transportation, that we have safe routes to school, and then we have a healthy meal when we get to school, and then across the curriculum, we have embedded opportunities to move our bodies. And sometimes when I do professional development, I, I hear from teachers that we don't want to use the word wiggle, or we don't want to use the word stretch, because I might lose control of my classroom. And I'm here to say that normal and typical development and children are actually eager to engage in that form of movement. So stretch your minds and stretch your bodies within that classroom. I love how Karen just said that it is about the opportunity to explore the environment. Doesn't matter how you explore it, you know, whether you crawl or creep within that environment. The fact is you had a chance to put your hands in the child had their chance put their hands in the grass and to feel that grass and to figure out how to transport from one one place to another to get that object that they wanted. It's just at a slightly different developmental stage when we're talking about schooling. Children still need these opportunities to explore their environment um, and to thrive within that environment. And I would argue that that involves some form of human movement across the curriculum. Thanks, Starla. Yeah, you touch on a really good point that it's, it's funny from an adult perspective you know, we ask children to do things in school that we don't do ourselves, right? Sit still, don't <laughs> forget, stay on task for, you know, long stretches of time when we all know now working from home, we, we take our little micro breaks and check the news or sports and get up and go get a coffee and all those sorts of things. So, um, okay. So I guess the next question is for me, and that is, is only aerobic exercise, uh, related to improvements in cerebral development in kids? Uh, and, and I would answer absolutely not. Um, what I'll tell you is, is that we know the most about aerobic exercise. That is to say, we know the most about aerobic forms of physical activity, walking, running, uh, biking, and whatnot, and its effects on brain structure, brain function, cognition, and academic performance. Um, but there are, there are certainly other modes of physical activity. Um, we know that motor skill building has um, has a, a, a separate or a unique relationship with uh, cognitive and academic performance. Um, in, in older adults, we know that uh, strength training, a randomized controlled trial of strength training uh, is related to changes in, in both brain structure and function as well as uh, cognition. Um, and, 
And I guess, you know, what I would caution you on is there are certain groups out there that suggest that there's only one type of exercise uh, or, or another type of exercise that are important. And that's just simply not true. When you, when you look through the entire literature, uh, there are many ways to get there. There are many ways to derive benefit. Uh, and, and what we know is that, is that may, what we know the most about is aerobic exercise. And so certainly I think that's a good place to start. That's the foundation um, for other forms of exercise. But, but certainly we, uh, we do know that there are other types of exercise that also benefit uh, uh, brain and cognition. So with that, uh, Naman, I'm gonna ask you, uh, there's a couple questions that are all very similar. So uh, let me at least ask you two of them or, or three of them and you can see if, uh, you know, how you wanna answer it. And one is, you know, does malnutrition affect brain growth and size? Um, and another is what types of nutrition are best for, uh, for brain health uh, and cognition? Um, and, and then there's even, you know, what kind of nutrition do we need to give growing children faster brain function? So I, I think, you know, you can answer this as, as you like, but they're, they're all kind of the same body of questions. Uh, so they're all great questions and uh, I think very, really important. Uh, when we think about early life and we talk, when we talk about deficiency in, in any, nutri any nutrient, uh, I think it's important to understand that um, it, in, when it comes to essential nutrients, uh, you know, when you talk about macronutrients like DHA or we're talking about uh, micronutrients, uh, you know, like vitamin D and zinc, these are essential nutrients that uh, are really important for laying a foundation for uh, brain development and brain growth. So I think deficiencies in any essential nutrient uh, result in direct impact on brain growth. Uh, but also, uh, when you think about what deficiencies do in terms of uh, you know, motor development, in terms of uh, physical development, also could compromise you know, uh, cognitive benefits that you'd see from you know, environmental enrichment, engagement in the environment. So <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize that certainly, you know, nutrition is vital uh, in setting the base in terms of brain structure and function in early life. Um, and uh, a lot of that development takes place uh, you know, early on uh, if you're doing fetal development and then the first couple of years of, uh, of life. Uh, and then it, you know, obviously continues all the way until uh, the third decade as far as pruning and uh, of synapses and that sort of thing. So at all these stages, uh, the effects of nutrition can play varying roles and depending on the nutrients that are somebody's deficient in those effects could be larger uh, in certain domains. Um, and what we don't know as much ab about is really the, you know, the complementary nutrients that are not called essential. So for the case of choline, uh, in the case of lutein, for example, these are nutrients that are still being understood in terms of deficiency. They don't always, you know, we don't have well-characterized deficiency criteria for these nutrients, but we know that uh, they may play uh, an important role in optimizing cognitive development beyond uh, addressing issues of um, you know, deficiency, particularly in children who don't have any deficiencies. So we know that nutrition plays a vital role uh, in brain development and function. Uh, I think that the two questions were about uh, you know, nutrition and sort of daily cognitive functioning and what would be considered to be helpful nutrition in, the, in, in that context. Uh, you know, what we're learning from cross-sectional studies and these little uh, and randomized control trials in this area uh, is that, you know, healthful nutrition in terms of supporting uh, a lot of other uh, cognitive, you know, health domains uh, plays an important role even in cognitive function. So, for example, uh, a diet that's, uh, you know, rich in, uh, in, uh, in, in micronutrients, in vitamins and minerals, uh, a diet that's rich in green leafy vegetables, uh, a diet that's varied in its patterns in terms of balance uh, of all these different nutrients can play a, a really important role. I think much of that literature has been captured by research on uh, diet quality. Uh, we know this in older adults, uh, for example, Mediterranean diet patterns have been shown in older adults to be protective or neuroprotective in later life. We're learning that similar patterns may be beneficial, particularly those in, that include dietary fiber um, as, a, as a nutrient source, as well as a healthier profile of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in the diet um, in children as well. So I think that, you know, as we think a little broader in terms of dietary patterns, there may be some um, important lessons there as well. Thanks, Naman. Um, I'm going to move back to Karen here. And a question that just came in asks, uh, uh, if parents are restricting movements and activity uh, based on risky environments uh, in their kids, will this have long-term implications uh, or, or future problems? Um, I, I, yeah. What an important question. I, I assume this has to do with COVID. 
um, for infants, just allowing babies to move around indoors in the safe environment of their home. Um, all the evidence we know of um, indicates that that should be sufficient. The older the child, I think the more um, important it is to find environments where they can do the kinds of large movements that are so important. And the older the child, the more their motor skills are interact with social interactions beyond just interacting with the caregiver. Um, so all the things that Darla was saying are super, super important. We don't know what the effects of, um, you know, homeschooling such a large swath of children around the world is going to do. And, um, and nobody knows what, you know, what the effects of restricted movements are going to be like. Um, but in my presentation, I um, showed some data from um, cultures in Central Asia where babies um, spend, you know, sometimes up to 20 hours a day bound from neck to toe in a special Gavora cradle. And that binding restricts all of the infant's movements. They can't even turn their heads. So really all they could move are their fingers and their toes. Um, and the, the onset ages are delayed relative to Western norms, relative to the World Health Organization um, standards. But Western norms and the World Health Organization standards were not normed on you know, babies from Central Asia. So there's something, you know, kind of ironic or perverse about comparing infants to a, like a so-called standard or a norm where they weren't, they weren't part of it. So, um, and, you know, as, as you all know, people in Central Asia <laughs> um, grow up to be just fine. In fact, by preschool age, um, our lab was finding that children, you know, are, um, doing some skills that um, you know you don't normally see in Western cultures. Children walking over narrow bridges, you know, as part of their everyday environment and climbing high ladders um, and so on. And there's other data like that, like the Ache Indians in Paraguay, um, in Eastern Paraguay, um, when they were studied in the 1980s, they weren't walking until they were 20 plus months of age, which is seem you know, like off the chart for um, Western norms. But by the time those kids were, um, you know, eight, 10 years old, they were climbing high trees and using machetes and doing all kinds of motor skills that children in Western cultures can't do by those ages. And for some of us, you know, by, by, no, no age. <laughs> How can we climb a high tree? <laughs> Machetes and so on. Um, so, you know, I think the, the real question is what's going to happen to this whole generation of children around the world whose um, movements, their social interactions, their everyday lives are so disrupted by COVID. And, you know, this is these are disruptions across the board. I would worry far less for little babies and far more the older the children. Um, and one, you know, one last word is, you know, those of us who are um, teach college students or have, you know, children who are in high school um, or in college, you know, it's really, really hard for them. And, you know, I, I, like developmentally, college age, children really maybe shouldn't have returned to their childhood bedroom and, you know, camping in with their parents for weeks and months on end. Um, so I think this is sort of a natural experiment, um, but the outcomes, you know, may not, may not be what we hope they are. So thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, Darla, back to you for one more question. Which, which of the health factors discussed there are most important for school children to perform well at sc in school? Um, well, just to clarify, Chuck, what do you, when, which health factors are you making reference to? I would imagine that we're talking about probably nutrition versus physical activity behaviors. 
Ah, okay. So Naman and I can debate this one. Um, I, I don't think it's prioritized one or the other, right? I think it's opportunities to do both. Um, so I'm going to sit right on the fence and I'm going to say um, both physical activity um, and healthy eating are practices uh, that we need to promote. Um, but children need opportunities to make these decisions um, on their own. So exposure to um, I'm going to eat a star fruit or fruits and vegetables that I've never had before um, versus uh, the French fries that I'm being offered at lunch. Lunch, right, so we need to provide these opportunities for children in a safe space to practice making those healthy decisions. So when they're on their own, um, they continue and sustain those healthy choices. Um, I, I was going to kind of elaborate, Chuck, on the five components of a comprehensive uh, physical activity program, which does have um, nutrition at heart as well. But there's five points of intervention, and those five points of intervention: one is compulsory physical education, is the formalized instruction and education surrounding human movement, um, surrounding making healthy choices and what are your options and how to understand those. Second point of intervention is the notion of before and after school physical activity. So we've already um, touched on the notion of active transportation to school, still promoting uh, uh, sport activity um, and uh, opportunities in after school programming for children to move. So it's not just after school homework that we're doing or not, not just after school care providing, but opportunities for movement um, after school as well. And the third component of that is the notion of physical activity during academic lessons. So getting out of your chair, going to the board, using humans as manipulatives as part of learning to understand um, the content that's being presented. Um, the, la the last two, um, one is centered around staff involvement, and that's the notion I touched on earlier about it takes a village to raise a child. So the custodial workers, the administrators, um, the nutrition service providers, this is all a comprehensive effort where we are also thinking about the wellness of a adults in that environment, I think they get left out of this equation. And so conscientiously having um, uh, some occupational wellness opportunities, um, those teachers with uh, who are healthy probably have a better executive functions, um, you know, to be continued on this discussion uh, about uh, future research about the executive functions of teachers and their health habits, right? So addressing the health needs of staff um, in that community uh, and caring Caring for our teachers as well as caring for our children. The last one is the notion of community engagement. Schools can't be a community in and of itself and function in isolation. They have to be well connected um, to opportunities within the community. And, and whether that is, um, again, engagement in youth sport program, access to green space, um, rails and trails, um, programming that's offered for adult parenting or nutrition classes, just the school having this purposeful connection. Um, and often we have a champion who does that um, within schools in the United States. Sometimes they're called um, community liaisons. Sometimes they are called a community champion, but someone purposefully making, identifying and making those connections for both parents to be engaged in the curriculum and for school to be taken out into the broader community. So I think those five points of intervention, Chuck, are really important. And then within there, you can address um, both physical activity uh, and nutrition as health behaviors. Thanks, Darla. Um, and actually, I think that probably leads into our last question of the day, which is for me, which uh, it asks, um, if children and adolescents stop uh, exercising, um, what are the long-term implications uh, in adulthood? And that is, you know, do they continue to have benefits for cognition? And so, you know, as you spoke about teachers and their executive function, um, one thing that several of our lecturers talked about is that physical activity improves executive functioning. And fortunately, what we know is that while uh, this is true in kids, this is also true in adults and older adults. And in fact, there's more data in older adults uh, than there are uh, in, in children. And so uh, to that end, um, when, we, when we stop physical activity, uh, we, we do stop receiving the benefits of it, meaning it's a use it or lose it 
uh, scenario for, for both brain and, and cognition. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I guess for all, for all of the audience who spent the last couple days in their chair, sitting there listening to lectures, and we thank you for that, um, it is time to get up and move because it does benefit you uh, the way it benefits uh, your children. And so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to end our Q&A session, and I'm going to turn uh, the, the floor, the virtual microphone, back over to um, uh, Natalia Wegman, who uh, is going to close the session today. Thank you for your time. Dear Charles, dear faculty, thank you very much for a fantastic session and great questions and answers. We didn't have enough time to answer all questions we came, which came during the session. And uh, I, uh, to participants, I really can ensure you that we will make effort and faculty will reply on those questions which are still remaining unanswered. What I would like to do now, I would like to summarize in three words the session which um, we had today. It was maybe a little bit unusual for the Nestle Nutrition Institute because most of the time we are talking about nutrition. We are not really talking about, you know, physical activity, motor skill development, and uh, how much it may influence brain and cognitive functions. And that was understand that it's very important to, to touch, especially when we are talking about period of life, like toddlers in the young preschool children, where we really do set up a foundation for healthy life. And uh, Charles Hillman, he, he, he set up this the, the, this the base for this session by explaining that it's true that uh, uh, our children uh, are not physically active as much as we would like or they have to be. And there's a different reasons to that. And understand what is, the, what is the link between the physical activity and brain development and cognition. It's not easy because you need to have a good randomized uh, research uh, trials on that. And again, it's not very easy to do that in young children for, for multiple reasons. So most of the uh, uh, research which has been discussed today, it was about the young uh, schoolers uh, and uh, a little bit older school children. However, when, when uh, Naima moved us to another section of, of, of this um, uh, session about brain and cognition and physical activity and potential role of nutrition, it's very clear that certain, first of all, adequate nutrition is very important. And if, if, if child is getting adequate nutrition, that potentially his brain will be developed in, in the way it has to be. But certain nutrients, they're playing maybe more important role and they're triggering more certain, certain parts of uh, developmental brain and, and uh, cognition than the others. So it's important to take in consideration, but definitely more research is needed. And uh, what was very important, one of the questions when Naiman elaborated about DHA, he pointed that that's, it's true. This is nutrient which has probably a lot of potential and, and more needs to come. And then, and then with, the, with the Karen, we moved to a very young age of, of motor skills development when child just come into this world and start to investigate this world by different means. And one which is the most important, that's the, the, the experience which he is uh, trying to understand this world. We all know, and we pediatricians, we know that there is a certain, you know, standard scheme in which months and which week child has to do certain motor movements, but it's not uniform and not the age, but mostly the experience which child has is giving him a possibility to develop. Therefore, it's very important for us as a pediatricians and for us as a parent or grandparents, it's very important to understand that we have to be busy with our children and grandchildren. We have to help them to, 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 to discover this world. And then our children are going to school. And uh, in a big part of the world, we parents believe that now school is responsible for children, for everything what is happening with children. And, and that's, uh, Darla explained us very well that Yes, school is responsible and there is a lot of opportunity to do the good things at school when we are talking about the physical activity and when we are talking about the healthy eating habits. And, uh, but this is not easy. This, this requires a very strong strategic approach. This requires a trained, very well trained personnel. And in this case, teachers are playing a super important role. So they need to take a big part of that and they have to be a passionate, they have to, to, to want to change the situation and they have to engage with children in that. So with this, I think that this session was absolutely great. 
And uh, it was a very great closing to the three days of the Nestle Nutrition Institute workshop when we were talking about the toddlers and important milestones in their development. What is still a big question I, I think is remaining open, what exactly the role of nutrition in different parts of the developmental outcomes. We know a lot and we still don't know maybe even more. So more to come and uh, I'm looking forward for the next sessions in upcoming times, maybe a, a better times when we can engage really in, uh, in, the, in the time uh, without just online, um, online and virtual events. And I wish to all of you as a faculty, all participants who, who, who took their time to spend with, uh, with the Nestle Nutrition Institute to stay healthy and, um, and stay tuned with the Nestle Nutrition Institute. Thank you very much. And um, with this, till the next meeting with NNI. Bye. At the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we have one clear vision, to bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. Connecting a world of healthcare providers, generating discussion and encouraging relevant conversations. NNI believes that the more we promote and grow the understanding of nutrition today, the more we can shape the science of tomorrow. So, we foster and disseminate nutrition research to a global audience, sharing a premium range of resources, offering both scientific and practical information, which is available anytime, anywhere, and covering everything from the first thousand days to healthy aging, from cutting edge science through to sustainable nutrition, to actively establish deeper, more meaningful dialogue inspired by your needs, fueled by your desire to be at the forefront of scientific thinking and ultimately to help you in your professional life. Everything we do is built around you to help bring nutrition science to life through the people who live it. NNI, advancing science for better nutrition.